Good day to everyone around the globe and welcome to yet another exciting episode of Living City. Today we will learn more about how data can help us to shape green space but also to improve them. And we know that we all appreciate the green spaces in our cities. Uh, the, the effects or the negative effects of an absence of green spaces are tremendous. But also if we have an abundance, we see a positive effect on our health, on our real estate price. And of course, we contribute to a more sustainable future. My name is Eric Tinga and I will be your host today. And we are here in the city center, the green city center of Breda in the Netherlands. And in the studio we have today from Sweden, Eric Swan, welcome. And from the Netherlands, Juri Maliefste, welcome. And Tom Rosendaal, welcome to the studio today. It has been several years, five years now, since Husqvarna, a Swedish company, decided to investigate the greenies, greenness of our cities around the globe. And for this, a project called Hagsi was initiated. Eric, you're here. You made it all the way from Sweden. Thank you. Thank you. Nice being here. And good to see you. Yeah. Um, you've actually been at the cradle of Hagsi and the creation of Hagsi at, at Husqvarna. And maybe you can help us out. What is Hagsi? Yeah, Hagsi, that's the Hugs, uh, Husqvarna Urban Green Space Index. And we're quantifying the uh, greenness of cities across the globe. So it's pretty much like a fitness app for mm. city greenification. So, and, and I'm actually quite curious. You know, Husqvarna is a commercial company mm. and, and they deliver all kinds of uh, green space equipment, but also data, of course, to, to helping green space maintenance. But why would they create such a platform? Yeah, it's a big task, uh, you can say. And, and this capability came out of an innovation program that we have been running for many years. Uh, and we really want to take decisive action in helping the world to become greener. Mm -hmm. uh, so we decided to launch this and uh, to, to really influence decision makers in cities globally okay. to be greener. So that's uh, a big yeah. task, but uh, hopefully it could be good for business and for humanity at the same time. That's, that's, that's a good message. And we actually have a decision maker of a municipality here at the table. Mm -hmm. We'll get to you, Tom, in, in a few minutes. Eric, so you've been working with Hoxie for, for several years. Mm -hmm. What have you detected is the most significant uh, development for green spaces? Yeah, uh, very good question. And, and looking at back at the five years of data, one really strong and happy message is that cities are getting greener. So that's, mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> that's a, a good finding. But uh, we also learned that they are not getting greener just by themselves. It, it's not uh, nature taking over. It's decisive action from city management that, that actually greenify cities. Okay. And then I'm actually quite curious, this um, uh, data, Hagsi, how is it being used today? Actually, I've prepared some slides here. And, and since we are in Breda, please, uh, yes. uh, Tom and uh, Jury, have a look. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, for a city, I think that you could use Hagsi for quantification of greenness, as I said, uh, for tracking the development over time and to benchmark with others. So looking at this, uh, example from the Hagsi website on Breda, you can see the different KPIs coming up uh, so you can track and understand what, where are we today, uh, both in terms of, of pure numbers but also as you see on this map. And we're actually on this uh, green dot in the middle here. Uh, yeah, that's this park actually. So you can see how it's distributed around the city. And uh, Breda is actually 49% green according to Hagsi. And that puts you uh, well above the, the global average that is 41. So uh, that's really g great actually. And, and on the development, it's, uh, things are happening every, every day, every year. Uh, so we're of course also tracking that. So for all the KPIs, you can see uh, the, the year on year development going. So we have data since 2018 and you can compare to uh, the different years, but also the, the regional average and the global average. And one kind of interesting thing that you see here is that we have a pretty significant growth in amount of grass in, in Breda over time. So where does this change happen? You, you see all these dots, the green ones are the positive change, red ones are negative. But in this map, we can also see the amount of change. Is it significant or not? Uh, going from grass into urban, or as you can see on these yellow notes, urban into grass. Yeah. So that's the development for you. So it's, 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 it's definitely about development. So what yeah. are the trends, right? And um, 
of course, you, that's very interesting to know for, for a city, you know, how green they are and, and maybe what trend it is. But I, I guess that there are also some green ambitions. And I guess that if you want to realize that, you need more data. You need to work with other data sources. And Yuri, that's actually why you are here from the company of Sweco. Yes. But before we dive into that topic, I want to ask you another thing. You are working on a very exciting uh, project called the Green City Challenge. Yeah. Can you tell us about that? Yeah. We started uh, this year with a, with a challenge in the Netherlands for uh, 350 municipalities that we have in the Netherlands. Uh, we want to help them to get more green. Uh, and we used Huxi as a basis to measure eh, their method to, to use KPIs, uh, the satellite data. We are using this to help the municipalities to get more greener with a challenge so everybody can compete. Eh, you're not probably the best, but you can be better. And that's the aim we want to achieve with giving them insights uh, to get more green. Okay, yeah. giving insights to, to get more green. Yeah. And, and uh, insights is data, or data is insights, or can be data, but what kind of data then are you collecting and providing? Yeah, I think data is not really uh, an insight yet. Eh? Data is just information. There's a lot of data, especially in the Netherlands. Eh? We use open source data. Eh? So the municipality has a lot of data on their own, but we use the open source data to, yeah, to, to also to uh, compare cities with each other. Yep. Uh, so we use the satellite data the same uh, as uh, Axi is using. Mm -hmm. uh, but in the Netherlands we have the, the BGT, the, the basic re registration of the, of the uh, surrounding surface. surface. Uh, yeah. Every yeah. square meter we know what it is in the Netherlands. Uh, if it, is it pl public area, is it private area? What kind of public area is it? Is it paved or is it green or is it grass? Uh, we know that and it's really detailed in the Netherlands and we use other kinds of open source data like the height maps to see where trees are uh, but mainly it's the satellite data combined with the BGT. Okay, yeah. that, that, that's uh, pretty impressive then and um, I'm also curious, it's, it's always fun to, to provide more data. How does this data or actually how does this, this initiative, this challenge help cities to become greener? Yeah. Well, the, the challenge is based on two, uh, two main parts. Eh? The one part is, is looking as like uh, Huxi. Eh, so quantifying the greenness of the city or a village, how green are you, uh, compare yourself with other cities, but also a uh, next step like going into detail, so show and, and, and uh, analyze how green a neighborhood is, because mm -hmm. the neighborhoods can also really differ in the city. Eh? You have really green areas, not so green areas. So we are also analyzing neighborhood areas. That's the one part. And the other part is that we also give insights on uh, greening potentials. Okay. Because we own, not only want to measure how green you are and say like you're, you're really green or you're not so green, you can be, can be more green, but you also want to give them the potentials to be more greener and to really go to action. But let, let, let's dive into that one. What do you think are the main opportunities then? Yeah, we see seven potentials, uh, but I think the, the biggest potential uh, is of course uh, uh, useless pavement. Uh, so there's a lot of pavement in a lot of cities, not only in the Netherlands, but also in other cities around the world. And not all this pavement is used, so why isn't it green? Eh? So we, we see, see this potential. I think the potential of trees is really important. Eh? We have to put more trees in cities. Trees are really important. They have a lot of value. Yeah. Uh, and in the Netherlands, but it's really a Dutch situation, I think, like 50% of the city is, is public space. We have a lot of gardens. Eh? We have a lot of houses with gardens. And we see that a lot of gardens are still a lot, of, a lot paved or artificial grass. Uh, so if they get more green, it's 50% of the city, that really has an effect. Okay. Yeah. What do you think are the most important things that a municipality should consider when aiming or when working to greenify their, their, their city? Yeah, I think first of all, there, there is a lot of potential. Eh? We, we show them if they do uh, compete with the challenge, uh, there's a lot of potential to get more green. And it's not always instead of an other function, eh? so it's not always green or parking your car. There's also space in between eh? if you're just be creative and look for yeah, possibilities where you can still put more green, that's one. You can always uh, start to talk with like, do, do we want green or do we want parking space, of course, but that's always a struggle and it's always difficult. But I think there's always a uh, possibility. Uh, yeah, put in more trees is also important. Eh? We see like 20% is trees in, in most of the cities, but I think it should be more. Eh? Really a lot of value on, on trees, also on climate adaptation point of view, eh? it's cooling down cities. We really have uh, well, heat stress problems in a lot of cities. I think they should also uh, put some more money on the green. Okay. Yeah. 
and, and, and that's actually an interesting topic. I, I, I would like to ask you, um, you know, there, there are many municipalities dialing in today and, and we have one at the table and, and maybe you can also um, bring a few attention points to, to you know, to yeah. the table now. What do you think are, are commonly made mistakes when um, engaging in green space planning? Yeah. Well, to, to uh, continue with the, with the money, I think uh, we have a lot of ambitions, big plans, a lot of cities have big plans to get more greener uh, in Breda in 2030, but also big cities, they want to have more green. But on the other hand, there's not a lot of money for green, eh? uh, for, for making green projects, but also for the maintenance. Eh? It's really a struggle for the people that are doing maintenance with the budget they have. So I think we as a society and the politicians should, should consider like, uh, we should put more money to, to, to the green. Yeah? Green is really important for a city. Also, the one thing I think that we are talking about trees, but it's not about the amount of trees, it's about the square meters of canopy of trees. Yeah? So okay. not you can put in 10 trees, but 10 small trees doesn't really yep. have a lot of value. It's about big trees. So you really take care of your trees in your cities and put some trees in, but then the big trees, because yep. that's make a, a really uh, a difference. Yeah. And that's what you can detect, uh, for example, with Huxley. Yeah, yeah. 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 yeah we measure the square meter of canopy because that's, that's yeah. important. I, I like to get back to this, uh, this interesting challenge that you have initiated, the Green uh, City Challenge. Um, you said there are over 300 municipalities in the Netherlands? 350. Yeah. And how many are participating? Uh, more than 100. Okay. Yeah. So 104. So one third wow. of the Netherlands us are already joining this challenge in the first year and we are doing this for three years, so hopefully next year a lot more, but yeah. one third is a really impressive number. Yeah. It, it is, yeah. and, and actually, and that's that's very much the effort of the municipalities themselves, I guess. And, and Tom, you're representing Breda, where yes. we are right now. Yeah, you are a participant. You want to know why? Yeah, <laughs> yeah of course. Uh, yeah, we have uh, as uh, as city of Breda, not only uh, the city municipality, but the whole city have formulated the ambition to become uh, the first city in in a park in Europe in 2030. So we have to compare what, what are we aiming for and do we reach that uh, the ambition. So th that was uh, the main reason to, to compete. And what we also see is that there are a lot of lists of competitions or uh, and one list we are at the top of, uh, of the list and, uh, and some lists we are uh, at least uh, not at the bottom but uh, not, not that high. So we have to explain every time why we are in the uh, first place or we are in the middle. Uh, and I hope the Huxi platform will uh, create standards so we can compare, compare each other. That's a, a very important reason. I yeah. Well, if, if 100 cities already are, are participating, yeah. Yeah. I guess some, some unified view will, will be created. Yeah. And, and actually, I'm also quite curious, what do you expect then to get out of this challenge? What I expect is a lot of data. The politicians uh, take their decisions but based on, on the input uh, we deliver. Uh, the better the, the input we have, the better data we have, we can uh, inform our politicians uh, better. Uh, and I also think it gives insight that uh, we, we mentioned the trees, so uh, have different uh, ages in, in, in trees, for example, but also that you can see you don't only have grass, but you also have some, uh, some green that are meters high or you have more trees. That, that's yeah, important uh, to, to have uh, insight. You can formulate your policy on that. So uh, we have to differ more. Uh, we see the biodiversity. Grass only is not uh, yeah. enough for biodiversity. So you have to have, have different uh, uh, source of greens. So. And, and, and because you, you mentioned we want to use data to influence decision making by, by policy makers. Yeah, influencers not may, maybe to inform them. To inform them better, yeah. That's okay. a better word. I think. And, and yeah. how could this data then inform them? Uh, because you can see, uh, actually see what, what, the, what is happening, what is taking place. Uh, we have, for example, we have now actions uh, to green uh, the gardens of, of our citizens. Uh, now, and you can see if that, uh, uh, yeah, if there is effect, if we take an action, uh, we say, yeah, we, uh, yeah, it, it helps. So we can put more money in it one, because it, it helps and then yeah. Yeah, you can improve that. So uh, yeah, you can convince or you can see that, uh, that the, uh, the measurements that we take that have, uh, that have it. So, so actually it ties back to Yuri, what you mentioned, right? The, the struggle to, to get funds 
this data helps you at least to build a case, I guess. The ambition is not only from the city and the municipality, but we want to, uh, the, the, the ambition is of all the city. And we need all the city to make the, 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 the city greener, yeah. because we, can, we can't do it on, uh, on ourselves. As municipality, we, we also take care of maintain the, the public space, but you, we can also look for, for other options to maintain the, the greenery, the yep. green uh, spaces. And that's difficult, but yeah, I think that's one of the options we need to, uh, to investigate. Yep. And, and is there another example that you could give where this, this challenge is already impacting the way you work or maybe think? Yeah, uh, uh, we, we received the, the data recently, but uh, for example, a colleague of mine is, is running around the city to see where we can uh, make the city more green. Uh, and uh, on the data he can be more specific uh, to look at some places where we think uh, it can be more greener. Than, Saves uh, time than to go yeah, outside. Yeah, yeah. 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 Great, that, that sounds yeah. like a very re rewarding job I must yeah. say, to, yeah. to uh, yeah. magically turn the city into, uh, into a greener place. <laughs> hey, I would like to thank you Tom for, for your contribution um, and, and I find it quite impressive to see that you have found each other. Uh, a company like Husqvarna, Sweco and of course the municipality working together to, to really uh, create a greener future. So uh, my appreciation for that, very much so. And uh, actually, as you can hear probably in the background, <laughs> green spaces take up a lot of work as well. Uh, there's actually uh, quite a lot of maintenance being done. Um, so there's another part of the value chain that we need to involve as well, and that's the people doing the actual job, like landscaping companies. So actually, from a large European landscaping company called ID Verde, we have Angus Lindsay on the line right now, and he calls in from his uh, hometown in the UK. Angus, how are you doing? I'm very well, thank you. Busy, but that, uh, that's kind of the way of the world at the moment. Uh, the grass never stops growing, so never a dull moment. I, I'm, I'm sure that in, in, in your line of work, there's absolutely no uh, silent or dull moment. There's always work. Um, could you please uh, introduce yourself to the people dialing in today? So I'm uh, Group Head of Assets and Fleet for ID Verde in the UK, responsible for around 2,000 vehicles and 17,000 pieces of machinery involved in landscape construction, grounds maintenance, uh, cemeteries management, sports turf construction, arboriculture, all aspects of, of green maintenance and management throughout the UK and Northern Ireland. That's, uh, that's a pretty, pretty big uh, responsibility, uh, I must say. Um, you're an expert, you, you have uh, tons of experience. Where do you see the opportunities for municipalities, the ones that you work for, to greenify their cities? In terms of opportunities, uh, well, um, I think the COVID pandemic has taught us a lot, and in particular it's taught us um, that our green spaces uh, especially within urban environments are particularly valuable. I'm lucky I live in the country so I can get out and about quite uh, quite readily but those in cities and um, built up areas that green space uh, is a luxury and something that needs to be looked after and made to thrive and expanded where possible I think um, because there is no doubt it does a, a lot of good in um, maintaining people's perspective on life and in particular their mental health so um, there's a there's a big push um, across the world I think for for maintaining these green spaces and, and getting the most out of them. I, I think many people will recognize that the, the importance and, and the effect of green spaces right I've, I've experienced that firsthand living in a city during the pandemic um, how important it is to, to get out and uh, get some fresh air. It's, it's good to see that it in the UK is the same as for the Netherlands, so it's, yeah, yeah, it's common. Absolutely. And, and then uh, Angus, you work for these municipalities. How do you support them in their journey? So as a business, um, we, try to, we try to come up with innovative ideas um, to manage these green spaces. It's, it's not all about just cutting the grass and, and keeping things looking neat and proper. In some respects, uh, you might want to rewild an area or at least turn some of it over to, to rewilding um, to encourage more in the way of um, insect wildlife and um, small mammal wildlife. So we, we look at, at options around that and try and come up to, with different ideas for our, our clients um, along lines of, of robotics um, where uh, 
field scale operations could be done by a robot which can work all the time uh, out of hours in the middle of the night and, and free up people during the day to do more horticulturally based tasks um, and concentrate on looking after shrub, shrub beds and flower beds, that sort of thing. Um, use of electric power tools, use of um, alternative fuels where possible to deliver the, the job. And I think that um, switching from petrol to battery, of course, has tremendous effects. But also it, it comes down to creativity again, like, like was mentioned mm -hmm. before, thinking with municipalities to create new uh, opportunities. So I appreciate that you take that role. And, and being a landscaper, what are the challenges that you are facing in your line of work? One of the biggest challenges we're all facing um, are budget cuts um, and, and staffing. We've, we've got an aging workforce within our industry in the UK and a lot of those skills are disappearing. And to replace them is not something that can be done overnight, especially when your clients are struggling with budgets and are, are looking for more for less. We need to come up with some ideas, improve um, the quality, but at the same time within the budgets that are given to us. So it's, it's a no mean feat in trying to do that, especially with a, with a workforce where you're having to train a lot of people in, uh, in new techniques and new technology. Yeah, and, and this is of course a thing that we've heard before, right? The budget, uh, it, it remains to be a challenge for, for many municipalities. Um, there are many municipalities actually dialing in today from across the world. It could be in, in, in Euro different parts of Europe, but also on the other side of the pond. Um, you have their attention. What do you think these municipality or these decision makers should actually do differently? I think, uh, I think a lot of the munis municipalities are, are suffering from the same, same problems as we are in terms of, of skills base and that sort of thing. And they need to, they need to understand what they're asking of their contractors um, or the people that are delivering their, their landscape maintenance and even their landscape construction. In terms of the construction, I, I think they need to be more thought as to how that, um, that new park, that new open space is going to be maintained. Um, is the equipment available for, for maintaining it? Um, if you put too many interesting slopes and hills and, and curves in it, can you maintain the grass as the, arch as the architect had envisaged? Because that, that might not always be able to be delivered. Uh, also, if you are going for a um, emissions-free area, do you have power out outlets to charge the equipment? Um, if you are using robotics and a robotic mower, is there a charge point for that? Um, all these things need to be considered before pen is put to paper um, on how it looks. You need to think how are you going to maintain it in the future. Likewise, I think within schools and educational areas, the more use of new technology in front of what will be the next generation will educate them uh, in, the, in the way forward. So a robotic mower cutting grass in a school is not only good for the environment in terms of uh, noise pollution and uh, no uh, fuel emissions, it's also teaching the next generation how best to cut the grass, how best to maintain areas silently and efficiently. Thank you very much, uh, Angus. And you point out again the importance of integrated thinking, that we need to connect the dots within the value chain from uh, a company like Husqvarna providing data, Sweco taking it to the next level, the municipality creating policies and executing, but also the landscapers to execute on green space maintenance. Thank you, Angus, very much for your contribution today. We truly appreciate it. I would like to uh, thank Yuri uh, and Tom for uh, attending at the table here today. We are actually switching guests right now. Thank you very much for participating and uh, let's see each other soon. Now we have a new guest at the table, Hugo van Bijsterveld. And you actually are a tree care expert at Husqvarna. And we've heard a lot about trees. Tell us, why are trees so important? I love trees, so that's one good reason why they are so important. But they also contribute a lot into urban areas, into the livability of a city, but also in the sustainability of a city. So therefore, uh, trees are a vital part. Um, and I'm a specialist within Husqvarna, but I also invited a real specialist 
related to tree care management and how they uh, collect data, create insights to do more efficient tree management. It is uh, Ian Hanu from uh, Planet Geo, CEO and founder, based in the US. And um, let's listen to him, what he has to share with us. Sounds great. Okay, Ian, welcome. What is Planet Geo? Planet Geo is based in the US. We have around 35 employees. Uh, our focus is greening cities, uh, really for the health, uh, optimizing health outcomes from access to green space. Um, we do this through technology. We have a lot of subject matter experts in-house, and with that, we provide data, tools, and plans to help cities become greener and sustain uh, those kind of greening goals that they achieve. Um, we have around a thousand clients worldwide. We have resellers and partners in a lot of different countries. Um, Planetio is also a really growth-minded company. We want to make the biggest impact that we can in, in cities all across the world uh, as we deal with climate change, uh, sustainability issues, resiliency, and so forth. So it sounds you have a lot of experience, uh, you have a lot of customers, you know exactly what their pain points and problem areas are. What is interesting to know is what data and what analysis helps to address these customers' challenges. Could you tell us more about that one? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, every client of ours has different kind of pain points and problems that they're looking for technology and data to provide solutions to. Um, it, it depends on, again, on their circumstances. Uh, if they're really far along in, in urban forestry and urban greening programs, or maybe if they're just at the beginning of their, their uh, journey, if you will. So uh, what we do is we focus on collecting data analyzing that data and putting that data into plans so that we can properly manage. Um, so at, in a city level, I often tell people that if your job was to manage all the street lights in a city, you'd want to know where they are and how many you have, um, what condition are they in, what's your budget for next year, what was the last time you changed the bulb. And it's just an easy analogy to describe managing trees in cities. So we tend to focus uh, on a bottom up approach as well as a top, uh, top down. So the bottom up is going to be on the ground, arborists collecting with the right proper tools and technology, information about location of trees, species. Uh, without that knowledge, they don't know what they're managing. And so you'll find that most cities are in that kind of position where they, they just need that baseline data. Uh, from up above, looking at canopy cover, that could be looking at trends, the opportunities that you have in the landscape for prioritizing greening projects and green spaces, um, overlaying a lot of different data sets to do that. So these, these pains are often just getting that baseline data in place so that then you can use that to support other parts of your program. That could be your budgeting, staffing, um, other types of resources that you need. Uh, in addition, there are um, I would say needs on historical information. So a lot of cities that we work with really want to know the last time they um, pruned a tree or when a tree was removed or when it was planted. So being able to track that information over time is really critical. Um, there's also a lot with transparency and the public. So we want to engage the public in the benefits and the awareness of trees. A lot of our clients come to us also looking for those as for some of their goals too. But Ian, I'm actually quite fascinated. You talk about transparency, but how then, how do you share this data uh, to, these, um, uh, to these customers to create more awareness? So we've designed tree plotter software solutions to be the best in class for uh, in-field experience for collecting data uh, using high resolution imagery and mobile applications, of course, our phones and tablets. Um, we store data in the cloud. One of our goals is, of course, to make technology really accessible to make it easy to use which is hard to do um, and to with all the data in the cloud of course you know it's, it's it helps with being accessible of course um, and there's a lot of tools and ways in which we share data so that it's really easy within our software applications um, to engage audiences again back to the pain points um, sharing and being transparent about where you're planting trees where the priority green spaces are um, how that data comes together in ways that allows people to really collaborate. Um, another thing that's interesting about our approach and our technology is we calculate the and monetize the benefits of trees. So we uh, leverage and integrate with the tree plotter, or, sorry, the uh, iTree software. And with the iTree software, we can calculate um, the carbon sequestration of trees, the impact on air pollution, on stormwater runoff, and, and other things that are really important to cities these days. 
And so that allows cities to have tools to advocate for increasing budgets, getting the resources, staffing that they need, and so forth. Um, one of the new initiatives we launched this year is called the Community Engagement Map. Uh, and the Engagement Map is uh, an interactive website to explore information in a friendly way about trees and uh, green assets. I must say that that's fascinating to put actually a number on the value of trees. I think that is uh, very interesting that i3 is connected to that because that shows really the value of trees. Um, what I'm wondering is how does this data and those uh, insights supports efficient tree management but also supports right decision making? Could you elaborate on that one? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, we, we always say in a lot of industries, but definitely in urban forestry and tree care, that you can't manage uh, what you don't know and understand. Uh, so having baseline information, being able to monitor that, track that over time, is really key to making informed decisions. We, um, we take the data, whether it's top down or bottom up, and bring that together along with you know, community input to create plans for greening cities. They could be urban forest management plans, urban forest master plans, uh, and similar kinds of uh, maybe green infrastructure studies and so forth. So um, bringing all that data together really drives decisions. If you don't know what you have, then you can't manage it, right? So there could be species information, it could be the size and condition of the trees, or the quality of the green spaces that you have. Um, one project we're working on right now, it's a great example, is City of Charlotte, North Carolina. Um, we've been working with them for several years. We have a multi-year contract right now, actually, to assess the street trees in Charlotte, uh, about 100,000 trees over the next four years. Um, between that data and all the information collected from the bottom up, as well as canopy analysis using high resolution data, um, we're updating that information constantly for the city to help them drive their plans and their policies. Uh, so that's really exciting. So what is the outcome for your clients using all these insights and data? Yeah, the outcomes is really what matters, and we try to focus on that. Um, what we want, of course, is greener cities. We want trees to be healthier, to be uh, well, more well understood and appreciated. Um, we want green spaces to be accessible to everyone uh, in close proximity, right? Um, we want cities to be well funded and to treat green spaces and trees um, as a, 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 an asset towards public health. Um, we need safe environments to enjoy and appreciate this. Uh, but really, in the end, we tend to want to move cities from being reactive in their management of trees and such to being more proactive. And so data and tools and technology allow cities to do that. Um, we want to see a cohesion across different disciplines and landscapes and professions. And that's really what the ecosystem requires um, to make the impact that we can on resiliency in cities. So the faster we speed up the adoption of technology, the faster and the better cities are gonna be and the more efficient uh, at, at cooperating, communicating, achieving goals together collectively. Speeding up the adoption of technology, I think that's a common theme as well, right? That's what you've been working on together For with sure. Sweco and hmm. together with the municipalities as well. Hmm. Uh, maybe I have a good uh, example to share where uh, tree management is really driven by uh, good insights and good analytics, but also driving the community engagement. Let's have a look at the video of uh, Charlotte, North Carolina, US. Perfect, movie time. Development of the early urban core neighborhoods in Charlotte placed a really high focus and value on trees. So there's really, really high canopy coverage and high quantities of big trees throughout some of Charlotte's oldest neighborhoods. We are the 16th largest city in the United States right now, which is exciting, but it also poses a lot of challenges because we have to do a lot more now to protect it from development, from those aging trees that were planted in the early 1900s. Charlotte is unique as such a large city because the trees have been protected. We have a lot of green space here. I think we're in between 46 and 47% in our last canopy analysis, and that's different from many large cities, and it's pretty equally divided across the whole city, and that's what makes Charlotte unique. Some of the things that the Charlotte community does to really give us a great ranking in, in, for green space is the strong policies and preservation requirements, but also there's a really big emphasis on placemaking. So trees are important here. We plant to preserve a lot of trees. So those benefits, they're reached on a greater level, not just citywide, but they're scalable to certain neighborhoods. Charlotte's gonna to continue to grow, and we need to focus our efforts to really provide those benefits to every neighborhood on an equitable approach.
We communicate with our citizens in many different ways. We are building our outreach program right now. We're actually in the process of creating a tree ID book to help people learn what trees may be in their backyards, which is exciting for us because we feel that if someone knows what the tree is, maybe they'll take a little bit better care of it. I think that's a great thing. So for next steps on innovation, City Council recently adopted the Comprehensive Plan, which is a plan guiding the growth of Charlotte till 2040. And in that plan, there's a high focus on tree canopy, both in the built environment and in the kind of general tree canopy natural environment. But they're also very expensive to maintain, so we're trying to provide a community-driven program that helps folks maintain those large trees on their property. It's a really exciting time in Charlotte for trees. I am looking forward to all of the planning work that's going on and the citizens getting involved and in helping to grow our tree canopy in the future. Huxley and Charlotte, North Carolina. Eric, Mr. Huxley, <laughs> what are your reflections? Yeah, my reflections, are, first of all, it's a beautiful film, uh, really sharing the love for trees that they have in, in Charlotte. Uh, and uh, yeah, in the data that we have, in Hugsey, uh, Charlotte is pretty much off the chart when it comes to, to urban tree canopy. And uh, compared to the global average, uh, that's 25% in, in, mm -hmm. in tree coverage uh, in, in urban areas. Charlotte has 56%. So that's uh, more than yeah. double the, the global average. And they truly care for, for the, the trees and uh, um, have, as, as stated in the film, really managed to engage the community to really be part in, in caring for these trees. Yeah. I think that's uh, a great example and, and a lot of cities could follow this example. Yeah, I, I think so too. And it creates such a brilliant atmosphere to live in or yeah. also as a tourist to visit. And the good thing here is that all these trees in these urban areas, they need to maintain. And, and for good tree maintenance, you need real prof, uh, professionals. Mm -hmm. uh, I invited a professional from Belgium, Peter Vergote. He's an arborist. Uh, should we listen to him and let him uh, share his experience with us? Listen to the man in the field. That mm -hmm. sounds like a wise plan. So welcome, Peter. Um, please explain to us, who is Peter Vergote? I am a self-employed arborist since 2004 and I do most of the time uh, subcontracting climbing work for many other uh, arborist companies. You work a lot with municipalities and municipalities they own a lot of trees. Based on your uh, years of experience, what are the top three mistakes made regarding tree management in urban areas? I would say that one of the mistakes is that too much of the leaves are um, especially from under the tree, are uh, removed. Um, the leaves are, in fact, the tree's own uh, organic nut nutrition. So it's, it's really important to have the leaves under the tree so they can form humus and, and make the nutrition and, um, and stay under the tree. The, one of the second mistakes is, is also under the tree that um, we can let the grass grow, so no short, short grass or a lawn under the tree because the mowing does a lot of the times damage on the trunk or on the roots. They um, make uh, some soil compactation and, and if you let the grass grow, there is some space in between for, for other flowering plants, so it's, it's interesting anyway. Uh, and maybe the third mistake that's made a lot is, is maybe the most important one is that uh, the city trees are, are way too clean and sterile and every last piece of dead wood is removed out of the tree. Um, I think in, in that case we have to step away of our human instinct to, to control the nature and try to give the trees the perfect shape as we have it in our head. Um, we have to let the tree grow in their own shape. As soon as we see something that can be a problem, the tree is cut it down. And we need old trees, really old trees in the cities for uh, more biodiversity. Very interesting. Um, and what would you then say, what are the easy wins for a municipality to really support a healthy tree inventory in their, in their urban areas? 
The most easy win, in fact, is, as I mentioned before, is stop mowing the grass under the trees and let the leaves stay there as well. Instead of using a lawnmower every week and doing damage to the tree, um, we use a brush cutter, for example, and we use that once or twice a year. Um, and because we don't cut the lawn, the leaves stay in between the longer grass, so we, we have less work. Yeah, and I, I don't think that the people out in the field like you there, Peter, have uh, um, an easy job. So a bit more time on their, on their hands generally would help them. For yes. sure. Yep. And I don't know if I can jump in, uh, Peter. Uh, we all know about all this benefit from trees, and I guess we need more. But uh, uh, do you have any things that we, we should consider when adding more trees into urban areas? I think planning and planting new trees, but especially the planning of the planting is really important to make sure that there is enough space underground and above the ground to let the trees grow all and not after maybe five years after we planted the tree that we have to do some construction work and dig some some more cables into the ground close to the tree and that everything is well planned from before another uh, important thing we need to consider is like um, Alex Shigo once said, he said, go out and look. And I think we have to look back on where the trees grow naturally. So we have to bring the forest soil into the city. And so we bring its ecosystem. Because this ecosystem in the ground is important to, to let the, the tree grow healthy. Protecting existing trees is really more important than planting new ones and have the old trees healthy and in a good condition is more interesting than, uh, than a young, new planted tree. So the long-term tree care can prevent the problems instead of um, solving, new, of solving the problems. Um, but therefore, we need to, to understand how the trees grow. I, I think, actually, Peter, that, that all the current trees, bigger trees are are considered to be valuable in, in many places around the world, Peter. So I think you're absolutely right to preserve those and not necessarily solve problems with planting new ones. Keeping uh, and protecting the trees you have yep. instead of just planting new trees. Um, an interesting area Peter touched on was biodiversity. And Peter, how could we improve biodiversity through a good tree management uh, policy? Oh, it's in the world itself is more diversity in age, more diversity in species, in shape, in everything. And even in, in maybe the same street or the same alley. So different, different species, different age, that increases really the, the biodiversity. Another opportunity is doing a good risk management instead of removing the tree when, when there is a problem, because what's seen in visual tree assessment um, as a problem is the most interesting parts in uh, when we look at veteran trees for other animals or plants are these the really interesting uh, parts that, that would brings life the most important thing to have healthy city trees is we need to bring the forest into the city Thank you, Peter, for sharing your insights and, uh, and experience with us. One thing, Peter, that you just addressed, and, and we've heard that before from Yuri, the importance of planning. Um, nature, at least in, in, in an urban environment, it doesn't just happen out of itself. You need proper planning and, 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 and execution. Dear uh, uh, people joining in for Living City today, we are about to round up and we are uh, left at this moment with Eric and Hugo, our final two guests. And I would like to round up actually with your final reflections after Living City today. And Eric, can I start with you? Yeah, perhaps I'm biased. I'm a data driven <laughs> guy uh, working with the insights. I think that uh, green space data and tree data, it's available. So I mm -hmm. think make use of it with allowing for, for great planning, 
budget allocation and also more efficient execution of, of those plans. So make use of the data that is available. Mm -hmm. Hugo. Connecting to uh, what Eric mentioned, data helps to manage trees in mm -hmm. a better way, uh, take more out of them, but we also need to take care of them in, in the right way, as, uh, as Peter has been uh, talking about. Yeah, definitely. Uh, I'll, I'll just um, add, add my two cents. Mm -hmm. You're the data guy, you're the tree guy, I guess I'm the, uh, the collaborator. And, and uh -huh. that's actually what, mm -hmm. what I enjoyed quite a lot today. Mm -hmm. So for me, the magic lies in the collaboration. So if we want to pursue the greenification of our urban areas, we need to work together. And when we do that, you see all this energy and you see the results. So those would be definitely my important conclusions. And uh, I would like to thank you both and of course our other speakers of today. Um, and with those words, I would like to round up this session of Living City. Thanks everyone for tuning in. Uh, this is an important topic and I am absolutely sure that everyone is just as enthusiastic and eager to work on the greenification of the world around us. And for now, let's go out and make the world a greener place. Mm -hmm.